Hi, my name is Greg Burrows, and I'm initiating a new video series or vlog, as some people are calling it, vlog, uh, that I'm going to call Inner Views. Uh, this series of short videos uh, is going to be focused on, um, for starters, uh, me talking about a uh, rather well-known uh, drum teachers or figures of interest in the world of drums and jazz drums. Um, I'm the, the mission statement of this is that I think that perhaps some younger students of drums might want to find out a, a little more about some of these people and, and uh, want to see if there's more out there. And um, here's a chance uh, to uh, listen to somebody talking about direct meetings, direct experience, um, contact with some of these people. I'm initiating the series today talking about my uh, old drum teacher from quite a long time ago named Henry Adler. Henry was a highly respected and beloved figure in the world of drums. Um, uh, he was based in New York City and, in fact, was a New York City native. He was born and raised uh, in, um, I believe, Brooklyn. And uh, this is what Henry looked like when I knew him. I took lessons with Henry um, in the very early 80s. Uh, so I'm talking 1981 through about 1982. I studied with Henry at his 48th Street studio, uh, West 48th Street, that is, um, for approximately two years. Prior to Henry, I was uh, started in many of his methodologies and uh, systems and books uh, by a local New Rochelle drum teacher named Glenn Sorge. Uh, Glenn was somebody who lived in uh, the neighborhood I grew up in and was a terrific teacher uh, and positive influence on me as a drummer. And uh, haven't seen Glenn for a long time. Glenn, if you're out there, Hey, let's uh, reconnect one of these days. But back to Henry Adler. One reason why I find Henry such a fascinating figure is that not only was he a beautiful person, really, and a great drum teacher, but he was also an entrepreneur, a businessman, a publisher, an inventor. Um, owner of a very popular drum shop. Um, and this drum shop uh, also featured the drum studios, practice studios, and lessons. Um, the man was in some ways a, a renaissance man of the drums. And uh, he influenced so many students and so many people uh, of multiple eras. So we're really starting in the officially the swing era of jazz, right? So popular music and jazz. Um, from approximately 1940 through 1945. Um, that's around the time that we refer to as the swing era in music. Um, pardon me, I'm back. Um, some of the most influential drummers of all time came up during the swing era. And uh, many of them happened to hang out at Henry's shop on, I think it was West 45th Street. West 46th? Yeah, I think West 46th Street. Uh, I haven't been able to find too much information on that shop, and um, actually it closed uh, before I ever got to meet Henry. Uh, he was already in a separate, uh, separately rented studio when I first met him. I guess I was introduced to him initially uh, by Glenn around 1979, 1980. Uh, Henry's shop was a place where uh, people like Louis Belson, I heard that Dave Tuff uh, used to hang out there. Um, so many working drummers of, of the uh, 1940s, 1950s, um, were spending time hanging out in Henry's shop. It was a gathering place. It was a practice place. Uh, it was a... Uh, a place to just really hang out and meet up with other drummers, much the way uh, years later, um, the modern drum shop, um, the pro shop, professional percussion center. I'm talking about really great legendary uh, uh, New York City drum shops. Uh, Drummer's World was my uh, place. I, I almost 
could have even lived there really in some ways <laughs> for a while as Barry Greenspawn, the, uh, the, the wonderful owner and uh, manager of Drummer's World can attest. I was in there a lot. Um, anyway, back to Henry. So um, without running off for too long about this, uh, I'm just gonna give a little background on my experience with Henry um, as a drum teacher. So Henry had a tiny rental studio when I knew him. It was basically a eight by 10 room. And in this room, he had two snare drums, a music stand, and he had his quiet tone drum mutes, right? So that was an invention of his. I believe they're actually produced now by the Sabian Company. I found an ad of these t quiet tone drum mutes, by the way, um, online. And this was an ad for the quiet tone. So the quiet tone was not really a practice pad. The old practice pad model was a slab of rubber rubber on, on a piece of wood. Very effective, still used today. It allows drummers to practice snare drum rudiments and build up their wrists and chops um, without making a whole hell of a lot of racket. Um, you can practice at night, you can practice early in the morning on a practice pad, and the only thing your neighbors will hear is just a gentle tapping in the distance. Uh, we still use that model today, such as these uh, pads like this, right? The rather radical and extremely creative invention of the quiet tone drum mute was that you could take your existing drums and you could take this unit and he produced them in different sizes and you would lay that on top of a drum, right? And it had rubber feet underneath it, which would sit on the drum. Um, the drum mute would pick up some of the natural bounce and, uh, and touch of a drum, but cutting the volume something like 90% or something like that. The very early quiet tone drum mutes, uh, supposedly, I never saw this, but the, no, you know, I have seen an old one. They had actually a little trap door, a little hinged door on the side that would open and open up the sound a little bit. So it was almost like adding EQ to the drum mute, right? So if you wanted a little more presence, um, stronger, slightly stronger drum sound, you would sort of open up this little door. Pretty cool idea, I think. So, you know, what that reveals is that, uh, you know, this was an idea, patented idea of Henry's, right? So, and it had all these creative touches. And I, I had a full set of these uh, quiet tone drum mutes actually for my whole drum set. They always had a hard time finalizing the, the, uh, the design and the patent on the bass drum mute. That was a real challenge and they never quite perfected it. Um, but the snare drum and toms, if you put those mutes on the drums, I could really wail on the drums uh, throughout the entire day uh, in my suburban home and nobody would be bothered by it. And I would saved quite a bit of my hearing as a result, right? So because the volume is cut way down and those drum mutes feel so natural. They feel like you're playing on a drum really. Um, with 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 way less of the volume, Henry invented these and he promoted them uh, aggressively and and wonderfully, and uh, so it's something that I really associate with Henry. And, and again, I think uh, those are put out by Sabian now. They're still available. The drum mute, the quiet tone drum mute, incredible product. I don't work for the Sabian company. I'm not you know endorsing anything. I'm just sort of suggesting it as a really cool practice tool. Um, now, Henry, apparently, uh, I didn't realize this until looking this up tonight, was that Henry also invented um, or, or designed, I should say, and produced, not invented, <laughs> of course, no, uh, he did not invent timbales, but he had a design and a beautifully produced um, set of timbales as early as the late 1930s, okay? And his timbales, um, I see they have beautiful calfskin heads on them. 
uh, of course, the standard post to hold cowbells. Uh, this is originally a, a Cuban uh, drum, right, or a Cuban instrument, I should say. Um, and, and Henry, through his resources and, and, and um, business savvy and incredible creativity, uh, designed the perfectly sized uh, a, a set of timbales, um, probably with the help of Umberto Morales, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know that he published a book of Umberto's, and I'll get to publishing in a minute. And the Leedy Drum Company put out the Henry Adler timbales. Those are beauties. And I'm sure he sold them in his drum shop, which was on, like I said earlier, 46th Street. Uh, lessons with Henry. Um, quick mention of his publishing business. He had a vast publishing, uh, um, a little mini, really, empire. Henry uh, published books such as um, the Buddy Rich School, uh, the, the Buddy Rich Book of Snare Drum Rudiments, um, that he collaborated somewhat with Buddy Rich on, on putting together. Mainly, Buddy was a promotional figure for, for the book. Um, Buddy Rich did apparently study with Henry or a, a little bit. Primarily, they were friends. I think they would hang out once in a while, and Henry would show him maybe some things about reading. Um, primarily, he was kind of teaching Buddy some basics of reading music. Um, Buddy Rich didn't really need drum lessons. He was a natural, and uh, he had stunning natural technique that he had developed in his long, long career starting in childhood. So so Henry wasn't really his teacher, although he's gotten sort of a reputation as Buddy Rich's teacher. Um, the famous and actually quite fantastic book that they made, um, the Buddy Rich book of snare drum rudiments, is still put out and it's still in publication uh, all these years later. Right now it's uh, 2020. Uh, I think the original publication date of the book was 1942. So that's a good long, long stretch for a book to be continually published, continually available. It's a great book of snare drum fundamentals of basic rudimental training. It's very um, methodically clear, very step by step. And Henry's teaching uh, method was very clear, step-by-step, step, patient. Um, he went as fast as you wanted, as slow as you wanted to go, and um, he would spend a lot of time on minute details. Um, you know, like, let's say, I'll just give a, throw anything out there, a paradiddle, a, 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 a flam paradiddle, right? So you would start really slow, and, you know, he would start you, uh, you know, just working really slow and step by step on your right, left, right, right, flam, right, left, left. Uh, and he was very concerned with, with movement and turning of the wrists, right? So I have always played matched grip, and so Henry worked with me just on my matched grip with the both hands being the same, but he was a terrific teacher for people who were playing traditional grip. Um, primarily, he would really focus on a, a good hand position, um, keeping the fingers enclosed around the stick and the turn of the wrist, right? And so he was, you know, again, also with the right hand, fingers really were stretched and put all the way over the stick and there was a good full turning of the wrist so that you could develop your strength and eventually whoops a daisy and eventually your speed right i'm not really warmed up now and so you know another thing that i worked on with henry um, was with one of his books called finger control um, i can't quite remember the author of that book right now but um he produced a very popular book on finger control and I found it very handy coming up um, to start developing not only wrists, turning of the wrists, and another big thing of Henry's was the fulcrum, right? He, he was one of the first teachers 
to talk about the fulcrum, which is where you make contact with the stick. So, you know, he would start you from the very, very fundamentals from the very beginning when you began with him and you would work slowly into building good technique, good movement, starting with the fulcrum. The fulcrum is the crook or the point in, in your curved finger where the stick would sit, right? And then your thumb would go over that, giving you a secure uh, hold and a secure point of contact for the stick. Um, I think he might have even coined the phrase fulcrum in, in terms of drumming usage. And uh, so in the right hand, the fulcrum is there, thumb and forefinger. In the left hand, of course, it's between thumb and forefinger uh, on the inside of that patty thumb muscle there. So handshake, right, position, stick goes in there for your left hand now in traditional grip. Lower fingers curl under, upper fingers curl over, and with a good secure fulcrum, right, right in there, uh, he, he really was a stickler on developing strength in the fulcrum and developing that muscle here and here. Um, so that once you had that foundation, then you get your turn. Right, right hand is there. And then you start to develop finger control. So, you know, we spent uh, several lessons on finger control. Um, the right hand would stretch out the fingers like this. The stick would be held in there and your fingers would close and open and you would get that fundamental movement and then you would start to apply it in your drumming, eventually picking up speed so that the fingers could be used with a little more agility and speed. And you know, in the left hand it was here, open, fingers open, fingers out, closed, open, closed. Again, one of these really fundamental movement things that Henry was a real stickler for. Closed, open, and then eventually, you know, I'm not a traditional grip player, but you know, you start to apply it into your playing. And it's very useful. There, there, there. So finger control, wrist movement, fulcrum, um, reading. Henry really got me started and going on reading music, which was very practical and something that I've used over the years. I don't consider myself to be a terrific reader, but I got a good fundamental background in reading with Henry's guidance. Um, any good teacher can show you how to read music and how to apply it. Um, Henry mainly did it just on the practice pads and with the basic reading skills. Um, one thing I found missing a little bit in Henry's uh, methodology was really playing on the drums. Um, I wanted to start developing some concepts with hi-hat, ride, um, cymbal technique, um, getting around on the drums creatively, um, and of course all that stuff you end up doing on your own anyway, really, in the, in, the, in the bigger picture. A good teacher just gives you a foundation and a basis, right? Henry did that, and he was a, a great, great teacher and a role model for giving drummers fundamentals, basics to work from. But I wanted to get more into drums and playing uh, creatively on the instrument. He didn't set up drums in his studio. It was just two practice pads, you know, or two snare drums with the, with the drum mutes and a music stand and your reading and your fundamental stuff. And um, for what he did, he gave a great background and a great uh, basis for, for a drummer to develop. Um, he did work on um, teaching a drummer to be ready for the market at that time, right? So ready to go out and work. Henry was very much uh, uh, concerned about um, getting a drummer ready to work 
and make a living, right? So he wasn't just showing you how to do fast, cool stuff to impress, you know, people and, and be amazing. Um, but he wanted to get you out there to play, let's say, um, a New York club day, right? A club day is uh, what we refer to as a generic term for um, weddings, parties, bar mitzvahs, birthdays, corporate parties. And at the time, really, from, I would say, the 1930s up until pretty recently, um, a club date drummer had to be very uh, prepared and very eclectic and had to be able to play um, on on command a swing, a ballad, a rumba, bossa nova, um, an Italian rumba, a tarantella. Henry actually would show you all those things and he did publish a book called The Drummer's Club Date Handbook, which I found really useful and and I used it, um, the information in there, to work. And I made a living doing that stuff for a while. When other work was dry um, in the 1980s and 90s, I would go out and play some club dates if I had to. It was a great source of work. It was a great source of consistent money. Um, and, and Henry prepared me for that. Um, another thing about Henry uh, was that he was a, a, a warm-hearted person. Um, very human, very understanding, very um, empathetic, terrific, silly sense of humor. Um, for some reason, he seemed sort of obsessed with the federal government. You know, I don't know. Maybe he was upset about having to pay a lot of taxes because he was a very successful businessman with a lot of investments, a lot of successful um, um, uh, enterprises going on, publishing. Uh, I think he was even a property owner, rent, renting space, um, publishing books. Um, I think he eventually got into maybe videos, right? Producing instructional drum videos, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least he did make one video under another producer. If anyone wants to comment on that. Um, so, so, you know, he, he would constantly make sort of snide remarks about the federal, federal government, the federal government, this and that. It was kind of funny at the time, I don't know. Um, but he also uh, had a reputation, a good one, um, for being almost kind of a therapist. I know that, you know, like if I had a bad breakup with a girlfriend or just having a crappy day or something, I would just tell Henry, I'm having a crappy day. And he would give you such a pep talk. You know, he would say, well, let's look at the bright side. Work on your, you know, fulcrum and let's get your speed up with the single strokes and the paradiddles. And he would turn uh, the music uh, and, the, and the drumming lesson into something that would lift your spirit. Right. And I think that's a sign of a great teacher. If they don't just sort of clinically meet out uh, information and give you the next assignment and create okay, next, you know. But he did it with passion, right? I think any great teacher of anything, frankly, should should motivate and should make students excited to do something. And and I, you know, I'm sure other Henry Adler students who might be listening to this can attest. You know, you would walk out onto the street of of the Times Square area where he taught, walking on a cloud, like you know, holding your books and your sticks um, and just dying to go somewhere and practice um, and develop your sp your skills and your speed and your you know your, your new information that you picked up from him that day um it wasn't just ho oh, hum and another lesson you know but you walked out of there hungry you know to to keep it going and ready for the next lesson um so after a couple of years of of really enjoying and feeling a lot of love and respect for henry I knew for me it was time to move on. And so um, I took two very different directions with two great teachers. Um, each was covering sort of a different area for me. Um, number one, I decided to take a couple of lessons at least with the brilliant Bob Moses. Radically, radical departure from what Henry was doing. Bob was... Uh, somebody working with one of the earliest uh, bands of Pat Metheny uh, with Jaco Pastorius on the bass. Bob 
played with a huge variety of, of New York's most creative jazz people. Um, you know, Steve Kuhn, um, Larry Coryell, um, his own incredible recordings and productions. And so uh, I'm going to do another video talking about my great experience with Bob Moses, now called Rakalam Bob Moses, um, and still very creative and vitally, uh, vitally active up in the Boston area. In order to get my hands moving in a more natural way and start to build up my speed and agility, um, I decided to go across the river and study with Joe Morello, great legendary um, guru and friend and, and um, master drummer of, of the New, New Jersey, New York area. So many of us in New York eventually ended up at some point taking lessons with Joe. I'm going to talk about Joe on a separate video. And a third avenue that I took, uh, uh, more or less within that, that space of a couple of years, I decided to take, um, after studying with Dave Weckl for a while, who lived in my neighborhood in New Rochelle, I decided to uh, go to Dave's teacher um, because Dave was also getting way too busy for teaching anyway. And so I went to Gary Chester. So I'm going to talk about Gary, my experience with the great character, the great uh, um, uh, fascinating, uh, um, innovative teacher, Gary Chester. I went up to his uh, ranch up in Rockland County, New York for lessons. So, but today we focused on, on the great Henry Adler. And I wonder if anybody, you know, who's watching this feels like sharing a reflection or a memory of Henry. Um, you know, it's, many of his students are up there in years, uh, you know, like me or older, right? I'm 57 now, and but he's got, t he's got students out there who are, oh, you know, up in their 70s, 80s, even 90s, whoever's still with us, you know? Uh, and, and I would love to hear from anyone who has studied with Henry or knew him or met him. Um, Feel free to comment or, or, you know, say a word or two about the great Henry Adler. Greg Burroughs signing off. Thanks so much for listening to me ramble and uh, and just flow and improvise uh, a sort of um, monologue discussion about Henry Adler. Cheers.